God desires that we actually give love. So we're made in the image and likeness of God in love, in light and in spirit. And our spirit is light and we are made in love. We're designed to be lovers, just like God is a lover. Giving love is our highest goal because that is the image we've been made in. The likeness of God we've been made in is to love. Following the independent path has twisted love, making it our deepest need and driving force. And that is a problem because then we're manipulated by the needs we have, the unmet needs we might have in our lives, looking that we are going to get this love from other people rather than seeing that we have an opportunity of blessing and loving others. We are looking to receive from them rather than to give to them. Sign up for Mike's new monthly teaching series, Restoring First Love, at eg.freedomarc.org slash first dash love. Another issue is with restoring first love is the nature of that restoration. What are we restored from? And again, this has been twisted particularly in the whole evangelical view that we're separated from God, that God has turned away from us, that God can't look upon us because we're sinners. And that separation has meant that we are no longer God's children and no longer part of God's family because we've been outside and therefore we need to be adopted back into God's family. But we were never separated from God. He never turned away from us and we never needed adoption. But I guarantee a lot of people will teach that we've been adopted, which meant before the adoption, we weren't part of God's family. So all along, we were always his children. But we lost sight of that. But our father never did. He never lost sight of us. He never turned away from us. He never did anything contradictory to love. Now, the meaning of adoption, therefore, is not like our English or the Roman understanding, but it means coming of age in the family of God. There's much wrong teaching about adoption and sonship that most is mostly because people have looked at biblical adoption through modern Western culture. The traditional view of the adoption of a son has absolutely nothing to do with the placement of an orphan into a foster family or a foster home. Rather, it has to do with a young man coming into the place of maturity, whereby the full authority and resources of his father are given to him. So Genesis 1, 26, God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth subdue it and rule god bless them god empowered them to prosper and succeed and if they continued walking with him in relationship expressing their god image they would have been fruitful they would have multiplied and would have filled the earth subduing anything contradictory to love and overcoming and bringing god's kingdom on earth as it was in heaven but they chose to walk in independence and therefore, they fail to be fruitful. But now we're not in Adam any longer. Adam is no longer our origin. God is our origin because we're now in Christ, all made alive in Christ. So we've been taught that we have been adopted by God. But that would mean that we are not his actual children. We're just adopted children. So Jesus is the actual child and maybe your son and we're adopted now that you can spin that that into into god choosing us by adopting us but that hides our true origin and full identity as sons in that we're adopted sons not real sons and that's a lesser kind of relationship and identity the truth is we've always been made always been his children made in his image and likeness that has never changed from god's perspective it's only changed from ours. That is just like the lost sheep, the lost coin and the lost son. They always belonged. They were never rejected or abandoned. They were just lost. And we have been lost. We don't know who we are as sons. 
Therefore, we think we've been rejected or abandoned or we've been not part of the family of God until suddenly we do something and then we're accepted, which creates a works-based mentality to salvation. And then Romans 8, 14, for all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. Great. Awesome. But that sort of can be misconstrued into, well, if you're not led by the spirit of God, you're not children of God. Well, all of us are led by the spirit of God because the spirit of God is in all of us looking to lead us. We may not follow that leading, but the spirit is still in us and we're still children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful, slaves. Instead, you receive God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now, in essence, we did all receive God's spirit when Jesus breathed into his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. But we weren't adopted. The spirit just came to reveal who we really are. And the idea of adoption has come from a Western view. Obviously, the Romans, it, which was the culture of the day in which um, the New Testament was written, they had an adoption uh, format, um, which which did mean you came fully into all the inheritance. But I still don't believe that's what it's talking about. This indicates we were orphans and not part of the family at all until we were adopted when were we adopted some people would say well we were adopted when we accept the adoption or when we pray a prayer of salvation others might say well god adopted us and then we caught up with the fact but the reality is i don't believe it really means what that's saying verse 15 for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out abba father the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So I've got no problem with that other than it's, it's saying that we need the adoption to recognize our sonship and to have a relationship which we can cry Abba Father. Now, the Spirit does testify with us that we are children of God, not that we will be or we weren't, but we are. And that is a continual present reality, even if we didn't know it. Now, let's read Romans 8, 14 and onwards in the Mirror Bible. The original life of the father revealed in his son is the life the spirit now conducts within us. The spirit is at work in us, looking to help lead and direct us. Now, the word translated as led actually means to conduct or lead as a shepherd leads his sheep god's desire is that original life through jesus is going to be revealed by the spirit who's at work in us to lead us to that life of who we really are verse 15 slavery is such a poor substitute for sonship they are opposites. The one leads forcibly through fear, while sonship responds fondly to Abba, Father. His spirit resonates within our spirit to confirm the fact that we originate in God. And this is really what it's about. We originate in God. We've always originated in God. God didn't put us outside of that Genesis, that original, original place. But he wants us to rediscover it. Verse 17, we're, because we are his offspring. Now, if you were adopted, you wouldn't be someone's offspring, naturally speaking. You may be adopted into the family, but you wouldn't be his offspring. Because we are his offspring, we qualify to be heirs. God himself is our portion. We co-inherit with Christ. Since we were represented and included in his suffering, we equally participate in the glory of his resurrection. Now, again, if you read that, in another version, it says, well, we need to enter into his suffering. In other words, people see suffering and the way, again, discipline, suffering, punishment as what God dishes out. And we enter into our inheritance through suffering. No, Jesus suffered and we participated being in him. Now we can expect the glory of the resurrection, not more suffering. 
And I think I was brought up to think suffering was to be expected. And well, we we suffer as Christians in this world. That was something which I didn't question when I was growing up. Now I realized that that whole understanding was that he suffered, so I don't have to suffer. That is the reality of the situation. Verse 29 of Romans 8. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Actual brothers, not adopted brothers, because we've been conformed to the likeness of Jesus. Jesus' life is the perfect example of sonship. His relationship with the father reveals true fatherhood. And we need to enter into this. And this is what Jesus wanted us to discover through coming through the resurrection and what that meant to us. John 14, 18. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Now, Jesus didn't say you are orphans. He was going and they might have felt abandoned when he left, but he told them he was coming back. So he was not going to leave them orphans. That's what this is saying. Not that you're going to be orphans, but he was not going to leave them orphans. I will come to you. In that day, that's the resurrection day, you will know that I'm in my father and you're in me and I in you. And John 14, 23 reconfirms that my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode or our home or our dwelling place with him in us. God dwells in us. God dwells in the whole of mankind. God is wanting to reveal himself to the whole of mankind. But we're not orphans. And if we tell people that they're orphans or rejected or separated from God, that God can't look on them because they're not good enough all of that nonsense, then we create a gospel message that is fit for eternal conscious torment and everything else because it twists the very nature of God and the nature of what salvation really is. Now, we do have the rights of sonship and also the responsibilities of sonship. We're part of a royal family. Peter talks about that. We're part of a royal family. We've always been part of a royal family. We have the privilege of being God's representatives on earth so that others can see what it's, God is like through our relationship with him. That was God's intention that Israel would do that. But Israel set up a system which completely didn't do that. It made it law-based rather than grace-based. Romans eight nineteen for the anxious long in a creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Everything is waiting for our revealing. And if we think we're adopted children, lesser than, then we're not going to connect to creation as co-heirs and co-creators. Being part of a royal family gives us access to the palace, if you like. We have access to the heavenly palace where we're seated in heavenly places or enthroned in heavenly places with Jesus, with where God is is dwelling and we have access to engage God in the intimacy of his garden or the throne of grace or amazing places within the realms of heaven this all part of the fact that we are sons of God and as sons of God part of a royal family we have access as kings and priests legislators oracles the order of Melchizedek all of that is because God has opened the door for us to enter into this wonderful amazing relationship we've been taught that we're orphans that need adopting but the truth is we've always been part of god's family we're predestined to have restored face-to-face -face relationship in love according to ephesians 1 4 it this is a done deal people can resist it but they can't out patience god god will continue to love them love will never fail and eventually people will come to the reality of who they really are and who god really is so there has never been any doubt that we would eventually discover who we are through god's love when we know our true identity we do not have to live like orphan children we can experience our true origin in first love and that is what god really wants us to experience the spirit does testify to our spirit that enables us to call God Abba, 
father, daddy. God wants us to know him as our father. And I believe the father wants to meet you face to face. I believe the father wants to look into your eyes and he wants you to look into his eyes. He wants you to feel his heart, the heart of love. The father wants to hug you. The father wants to tell you how much he loves you. Picture a door, the door in your spirit. The father's knocking. Invite the father in. And as the father comes in, he hugs you and he breathes his very breath into you. As you breathe in his life deeply, you feel the rhythm of his heartbeat as he hugs you, as he embraces you. You feel like you're home in his embrace. I believe God would just start whispering directly into your heart some of those amazing thoughts he has about you a vast sum of thoughts all good and as he speaks let them restore you to his original desire for you as he shares his heart of love but words of love and affirmation and encouragement of nurturing and caring, of compassion. I love you. You are the treasure of my heart, the apple of my eye. I love you. 